Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the study of the word will strengthen us in our movement, progress on to the eternal city in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the Bible study today. And we're asking, Lord, that your spirit will take the word, apply it to our hearts, and make us to know how to practice, to do, to perform everything you're teaching us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming in a Bible study today to chapter 6 of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. We're studying from verse 1 all through to verse 6. Please open your Bible, brethren. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, born again, saved, sanctified, spirit-filled, scripture-saturated, spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. It tells us in verse 2. It says, Bear ye one another's bodies, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Verse 4, then says, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Look at verse 5. For every man shall bear his own body. Verse 6, it says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Let's search 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1, now I, Paul, myself, beseech you, plead what you beg of you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. The Lord Jesus Christ has left us the word. And he says, we read that word, and he says, how readest thou? And when we read, we practice the word. We do the word. He says, everyone that heareth these things of mine, and doest them, shall be likened unto a wise man that buildeth his house upon the rock. And the wind blew, and the storm came, and beat upon the house. And he stood firm, because it was built on the solid rock, the rock of performance, and the rock of practice, and the rock of doing what were being taught. Then on the other hand, it says, and everyone, everyone, Coming to the Bible study. Everyone listening to the Bible study. Everyone enjoying the Bible study. And everyone that carried the says of mine and doeth them not. He hears, he doesn't do. He learns. He doesn't do. He even writes down some notes, but he doesn't do. And he's regular at hearing the word, but he doesn't do. Everyone that doeth not shall be likened unto a foolish man that built his house 
upon the sand without any foundation. And it says, the wind will come and the storm will come and beat vehemently upon that house. It will fall. It will collapse because it doesn't have the foundation of hearing, hearkening, heeding, and doing the word. I'll pray you'll be a wise hearer, doer, performer in Jesus' name. Today we're looking at bearing others' bodies by the Spirit of Christ's meekness. Christ, meek and lowly. We have his nature. We have his mind. We have his heart. We have his lifestyle. It says, come unto me. O ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then it says, take my yoke upon you. It says, because I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest for your soul. That meekness in Christ, that lowliness in Christ, that temper in Christ, that gentleness in Christ, through that meekness and gentleness that has implanted in our heart, we humbly meekly do and observe the word of God. And when others are falling, when others are faulty, and when others have gone astray, in that gentleness of Christ, in that meekness of Christ, we help them up, bearing others' bodies by the Spirit of Christ's meekness. We're dividing the message to three parts today. Number one, patiently restoring others to the fellowship and love of Christ. Number two, purposefully relieving others and fulfilling the law of Christ. Number three, positively reflecting the fullness of our learning from Christ. Look at number one. Number one, patiently restoring others to the fellowship and love of Christ. Once again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, brethren, born again people, saved people, children of God, brethren, brothers and sisters, those who have come into the kingdom of God and you are a member of the family of God, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Ye that are spiritual, brethren, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We're dividing this to three parts of titles. Number one, we're looking at restoring faulty brethren in the meekness of Christ. It's a brother, it's a sister, it's faulty in his understanding, in his perception, in his behavior, in his character, in everything he does, and you overtake him in a fault, restoring faulty brethren in the meekness of Christ. Number two, reaching falling backsliders. It's not just that he's faulty in his understanding and perception, is backsliding, is gone back, is separated himself from Christ. His salvation is not even sure about it anymore because he has been severed from the vine and now he's a severed branch and he is a falling backslider. You are reaching those falling backsliders with the message of Christ. Number three, reawakening false brethren. You see, I'm still a brother. I'm still a sister, but it's false. You know that the self-deception, the life does not show. But their fruits, ye shall know them. He doesn't have 
the fruit. It doesn't have the grace. It doesn't have the standing. It does not have the standard of a real believer. But he's still claiming, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm still a member of the church. Uh -uh. It's a false person because it says the false brethren. We are awakening false brethren as ministers of Christ. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at restoring faulty brethren in the meekness of Christ. That's exactly what Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 is saying. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 24 there. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach and patient. The servant of the Lord, the child of God, the sons and the daughters of God, they've discovered this person is a faulty brother, is a faulty sister. And now you have the calling and the responsibility of restoring such a person. Remember, it must be in the spirit of meekness. You cannot restore somebody in the attitude of anger. How is it? I heard you're no more straightforward. I heard you did this. I heard you did that. And then you're angry. Anger has never restored any faulty brother or sister. You get angry. You say you have grace, you are angry. You say you are still standing, you are angry. You say you are really a child of God and you are angry with him. He doesn't claim to have the grace. He's falling. He's overtaking in a fault. We do not restore. We cannot restore anyone with the spirit of anger. If you try it, you waste your time and there will be no reward and you're not, you are not going to succeed. You are not going to uh, make that person to come back. Now, we don't restore anyone with the lifestyle of backbiting. Did you hear? Did you know? I saw him myself. And I saw what she put on. I saw who the people he was moving with. You can never restore anyone with backslide, with backbiting. You cannot restore anyone in the spirit of compromise. I want to restore him. He's gone far away. And because he's gone away from the Lord, I, I will be like he is. If he has gone into smoking, I will hold a cigarette. If he's uh, gone into drinking beer, I'm going to hold the bottle. If whatever he's doing, I'm going to act like him and dress like him and talk like him and behave like him. Never will you be able to restore anyone with the attitude and the lifestyle of compromise. You keep on standing. If somebody has fallen into the well and you want to get that person out, you need to stand outside the well. You cannot fall and dip yourself and dive into the well. And now both of you are down there. You'll not be able to help him. The servant of the Lord, the child of the Lord, as he's going to restore another person, must not strive. But be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. May God give us the grace and the lowliness and the, and the meekness to help all those who are falling and faulty and gone away in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two is reaching, falling, 
backsliders with the message of Christ. He has taught coming to the fellowship. He has taught reading his Bible. He has taught relating, interacting with fellow believers. He now enjoys the people in darkness and the people in evil and the people of the world and he relates with them more. This fellow is backsliding. Not only that, what he used to believe, that Christ is the only way, that Christ is our Savior, Christ is our Redeemer, and there is no other Savior apart from Christ. He is now modeled up. He is a backslider, a backslider in doctrine, a backslider in his deeds, a backslider in his declaration. Even the words that are coming out of his mouth, you can tell a backslider is talking. Now, you want to reach him. You want to reach her. How do you do that? Well, the message of Christ. No argument or the message of Christ. No bitterness or the message of Christ. No crushing and criticism. You cannot criticize somebody and bring him back from the stage of backsliding. You come to him with the message of Christ. I'm looking at Galatians chapter four, 5, reading from verse 4. It says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are falling from grace. Those are backsliders. They are falling from the grace of God. And they think now that a self-effort a self-righteousness they, they think it's a, a self-endeavor what i do by myself they have forgotten christ they push christ aside and because christ is not in their thought and christ is not in their way and christ is not in their embrace falling they do not have the strength and they, they do not have the power to live in righteousness anymore. They are falling from Christ. They might still be outwardly, externally acting as if I'm a child of God. I'm a believer. Don't condemn me. I know who I am and I know where I'm coming from. I know where I'm going. He is a backslider. It, is, it, it, it depends now on the rituals. On the ceremonies, on the laws of the old covenant, he has fallen from grace. And such people for you to reach them, bring Christ unto them, the lover of our soul. Bring Christ unto them, the one that came for everyone and came for them. Bring Christ unto them, that Christ is our Savior. Christ is our restorer. Christ is our redeemer. And as you preach Christ unto them, no anger, no bitterness, and there's no criticism, you draw them back unto the Lord. We're looking at James chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. James chapter 5, reading from verse 19. It's telling us about how we restore the people who have gone back and the people who are backsliding, I will restore them back to Christ, back to the fellowship, and back to their earlier faith in the Lord. In James chapter 5, reading from verse 19, brethren, if any of you, any among us, do you know anyone who used to be saved, standing, steadfast, spiritual, depending on the Lord, but now it's not like before. It's come back, back to the world, back to his vomit, back to a vomit, a vomit, if any of you do err from the truth. And one 
convert him. He's edged from the truth. He's gone away from the truth. He shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son shall make you free, he shall be free indeed. He's gone away from the truth, from the Son, from our Savior. And it says, see if any of you do hear from the truth, and one convert him. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, let him know that he which converted the sinner in verse 19 any of you in verse 19 a brother in verse 19 a sister but now even though he was one of us is backsliding you can tell from his language. You can tell from his appearance. You can tell from the places he goes. You can tell from all those things he's looking for when nobody is there. You can tell by his lifestyle. Now, if you convert him, he that converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. How do I understand that? If he is not converted again, if he is not restored again, if he remains outside the kingdom, a backslider, if he dies in that condition, that will mean eternal death. But when you go to them in meekness, in gentleness, in love, in real compassion, then you minister to them the message of Christ and you save that soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. We're coming to number three here. Number three, reawakening false brethren as ministers of Christ. We, as ministers of Christ, we're not just preaching. We have a purpose in the preaching. We're not just teaching. We have a purpose in the teaching. We're not just giving instruction. We have a purpose in the instruction that we give in the congregation. There will be people, either they are backsliding, or they are false, or they are really detached from the Lord and the purpose of the preacher, the purpose of the one that comes to declare the word of truth is to alert them, convict them, and make them, persuade them that they will get up from their situation of false profession. And we do that as ministers of Christ. False brethren, did you know there are false brethren? Look at Second Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 26. It says in Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul the Apostle said, In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, Jews like himself, in perils by the heathen, errant unbelievers, pagans, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the city. Look at this, in perils among false brethren, false brethren, in perils among false brethren. He has spoken about being in perils among the heathen, among the Jews, and now he says, false brethren, who are these? These are people who are so-called brethren, and they live like the world, and they act like the world, and they behave like the world, and they are as injurious to the apostle, to the preacher, as the heathen, as the religious Jews, as the unbelieving people, their actions, their plan, their plot, everything they do, they are as terrible in hindering the progress of the gospel as the people 
who have not even been saved at all. And Paul the Apostle said he was imperious, plural, imperious among false brethren. Now, to recover those false brethren and to return those false brethren out of the jungle, the wilderness of sinfulness, where they are, and to bring them to the wonder of the salvation and the restoration of the Lord. How do we do that? That's our calling as ministers of God and ministers of Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 14. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 now, we exhort you, brethren, one them that are unruly. The people are like rioters, they're unruly, they're incorrigible, they're uncontrollable, and, and they remain in the church. It's like they're not hearing any word, they're not hearing any message, the heart has not been turned in the right direction. And it's the same character, the same behavior of the people of the world that they manifest that the preachers and the preaching are in peril of those false brethren. Warn them that are really comfort the feeble minded and support the weak, be patient toward all men. No fighting. Be patient towards all men. No violence. Be patient towards all men. If you're going to reawaken them, if you're going to bring them from where they are to where they ought to be, you cannot use rough language. You cannot have angry disposition. You cannot run at them and say, I hear that you are false brother. I hear this is what you are doing. I came to warn you. You will will go to hell. Uh -uh. You're not fighting with them. You're trying to rescue them. Rescue the perishing. You care for the dying. And you speak the word of God to them in love. But you speak persuasively. It tells us in Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Whom we preach warning every man there are some preachers there's no warning for the sinner there's no warning for the backslider they are loving 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 people and even when they see people going down the drain and going the direction of hell they'll keep on smiling god is good god is still a dead man is perishing warn him tell him of the future of the person that dies in sin. Because that's a responsibility warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Perfect in Christ Jesus. And the Lord make his word, make his ministry to prosper. In our hands, in restoring people, rescuing people, releasing people, and reawakening people in Jesus' name. Let me have a good, good amen. amen. We come to point number two. Point number two is purposefully relieving others and fulfilling the law of Christ. It will explain something here. We purposefully in our ministry, in our stretching out a helping hand, in our teaching, in our preaching, in our helping people, there must be a purpose. There must be a purpose, actually. When I was teaching, uh, when we were writing at the primary school, the notes of lesson at the beginning will say the purpose, the aim, 
what I intend to achieve after the lesson I'm giving to my pupils today, then we'll stage the purpose. And everything we'll say, everything we do in that class, we have that purpose in mind. As you become a teacher of the world, you're not just preaching to fulfill all righteousness, you have a goal, you have a purpose. You look at the passage and then you look at the people and you want to see how to purposefully fulfill everything we have in that word. That's the word purpose. And you need to understand that anytime you're talking to a sinner, anytime you're talking to a backslider, anytime you're talking to a believer, anytime you're talking to the sick, anytime you're talking to demonize, anytime you're talking to those who are changed in their evil habit, you have a purpose that the purpose is that I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to be nice to him. I'm going to reach her. I'm going to reach him so that this purpose of restoring them will be fulfilled. Purposefully relieving others and fulfilling the law of Christ, the principle of Christ, the desire of Christ. Look at Galatians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 2 there. In verse 2, bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, for every man shall bear his own body. Do you see those two verses? Some people take verse 2 and they read, bear one another's body. And they never read any other verse. Then we we'll come to verse 5. For every man shall bear his own body. Why the difference here on earth when we can help each other, when we can lift each other? When we can support each other, that's verse 2, bear one another's body, then shall, shall in the future, every man shall bear his own body. Once we cross the bar of death, nobody can bear the body for you or with you. You will stand at the judgment of God all by yourself. That's talking about that future. When you come to make account and when God comes to demand from you how you lived, how you believed, what you believed, and how the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary became effectual in your life. At that time, daddy, mommy, brother, sister, minister, pastor, Preacher, supporter, helper cannot bear the body with you. You stand by yourself at the judgment seat of Christ. For every man shall bear his own body. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, number one, bear others' bodies with humility. Number two, build your own behavior on holiness. Number three, believers only backbone for heaven. When you meet him on that final day, you cannot stand with another person's backbone. Even today, you cannot stand with daddy's backbone. If your backbone is broken, you cannot say, daddy, I'm going to stand, stand firm, and stand erect by your backbone. And if your backbone is bent and curved, and it's not, you're not able to stand straight, you cannot borrow another person's backbone to stand. And on the final day, the, fine, the day that leads to eternity, you cannot stand by another person's salvation, Another person's sanctification, another person's sacrifice, another person's submission, another person's steadfastness. If anyone is going to stand on that final day, they will have to stand 
by his own, our own backbone. Point number three, believers only backbone for heaven. Come to number one. Number one, bear others' burdens with humility. Already you see, look at Galatians uh, chapter 6 from verse 2. Bear ye one another's bodies, not with pride, not with arrogance, not with see who I am, see how strong I am, not with carnal comparison. You are weak, I am strong, so I come, I can take extra load. Uh -uh. You come with humility. Bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, For if a man think himself or herself to be something when he is nothing, without me you can do nothing. If you run ahead, no prayer. If you run ahead, no patience. If you run ahead, there's no purity of heart. And I'm this, I'm this, you are here, you are there. If a man, if a woman think himself to be something, to be somebody, when it's nothing, he deceiveth himself. We we'll walk softly, we we'll walk humbly, we we'll walk gently we we'll walk in a lowly manner we know that we only depend on christ are you better than those who are backsliding not at all are you higher than those who have missed their steps not higher have you are, are you greater than those who have kind of broken their bones in the wilderness not really. It's the grace of God. And if you know it's the grace of God, if you're going to help other people, you come with humility and gentleness. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, meaning from verse 24, not for that we have dominion over your faith. Don't act in an unintelligent manner in the Christian race. As if you have dominion over the faith of another person. Over the faith of another person. Over the life of another person. Walk gently. Who are you, by the way, to control another man's life? Who are you, by the way, to control another daughter's life? A daughter of God. And you don't allow them to walk in their understanding and to walk at their pace and to move on with the understanding. We're hearing the word together. Watch over yourself. And you don't have to come after the brother, after the sister, and club them on the head. Run, run. Be faster. That's not why you are a leader. A leader is not to oppress the people. A leader is not to have dominion over their faith. A leader is to show the example and go in the way. And as you go in the way and you show the example, then you encourage them. You say, um, can I help you? I'm also, uh, you know, as weak as this, but what helps me? I reach the word. I believe the word. I stand on the word. And when I have a water that overwhelms me, I call upon the Lord and he helps me. That is the way we help other people, not by bravery beating them. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. By faith ye stand. Not by force. Not by force. You come to another believer and you use force. They won't stand. They won't stand. They will not be afraid of God. They will be afraid of you. They'll not be yielding to God, they'll be yielding to you. They'll not be answering to God, they'll be answering to you. You'll be the object of their attention. 
because you are coming now. You are going to ask that question. You are going to be very, very stern as if it's only by your force they will get to heaven. It's only by your force they will be faithful unto the Lord. Be a helper, a helper of their joy, a helper of their faith, but by, because by faith, this time. Look at number two here. Number two is build your own behavior on holiness. Base your own behavior on holiness. Don't be too much in a hurry. I want to help him. It's all right. But your behavior, your action, your behavior, your approach, your behavior, your lifestyle, your behavior, your disposition. I want to help her. Your behavior, what she will understand by the way you say what you say, by your posture, by your action, your behavior base and build your behavior on holiness. If you're going to help me to be, you know, more straightforward and more uh, courageous and more fearless and more devoted to the Lord, my brother, how will you help me? By force? And all I'm looking at is the force. I can't even see your intention. The good intention you have, I can't even see that. All I can see is, <laughs> if you don't want to suffer, bend for this man. If you don't want to suffer, bend for that woman. I'm only thinking about your force. I'm not thinking about what good are you trying to do and convey unto me by your action. But if you come as a helper, and I can see that you really want to help. I can see your gentleness. I can see your lowliness. There's no pride. You, you can't come to somebody with pride and say, come on, stand up. He'll be, his, his knees will be knocking together if I don't stand up quickly. If I don't stand up the way he wants and the way she wants, I don't know what she's going to do. That's not how to help people. You want to help people. The way we help people is that you base your action, you base your appearance, and you base everything you do on holiness. And let's look at Galatians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 3 there. In verse 3 it says, for if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And then in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, but let every man prove his own work. Then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. When you settle your relationship with God and the heaven knows that you are rightly related with heaven. And you don't forget yourself. You don't forget your need. You don't forget your own holiness. And then you come after settling that then you can do good and you will do well and do good in Jesus' name. Look at this in Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 32. Acts chapter 20. Looking at verse 32. The Lord is telling us here that if we're going to help people, if we're going to be of any benefit to people, we need to have the life of holiness, life based on holiness. And it is that holiness, actually it's called sanctification, the purifying of the heart, the purging of the heart, that there is nothing there intended to hurt the person you're speaking to. And it is that foundation of holiness. It is that bedrock of holiness. It is that pivot of holiness, the pillar of holiness that you stand on, that every area of your life, every 
disposition you have is based on that holy life, holy heart, holy disposition. It's that that you build on that can help other people. And in Acts chapter 20 verse 32, it says now, brethren, all the brethren, I commend to you, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Can you help somebody without being gracious? Can you lift up anyone without being gracious? Can you help and make people to move forward without grace, without graciousness? It says, that's why Paul the Apostle said, by the Spirit of God, it says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Able to build you up. Will you please think about building up yourself before you try to build up another one? That's tough. That's difficult. If you are not built up yourself on the foundation, on the basis of holiness, how can you build up another one, another person on that same foundation of holiness? It says, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. Sanctified by faith. It's that sanctification that registers, that implants, that holiness in your life, then on that basis, by the grace of God, you are watchful. You want to rescue another person. It's going the wrong direction. You must be going in the right direction to know how you are going to lift them up, to live a life that is pleasing unto God. I pray God will make us watchful in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 12, we're reading from verse 10. It says, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. It's talking about our parents that we have. They chastened us. They disciplined us after their own pleasure. I can just remember when I brought my card, my report sheet back home, and my daddy looked at, you know, English, literature, biology, chemistry, physics, and then he saw the, the, the you know, the marks there. Why is this one 24%? Why is this one 30%? Why is this? I couldn't tell him. But, you know, in my heart, daddy himself did not know all subjects and is asking me why I couldn't talk. And then he will rebuke me and chastise me. Sometimes we who are chastising people and we who are rebuking people, the things we are rebuking them for, we need to have settled that in our own report card in our own lifestyle, so that we're not just chastening people after our own pleasure. But now it says in the second part of that sentence, but he, God, for our profit. He corrects us for our profit. When you are going to correct other people, let it be for their profit. When you are going to challenge other people, let it be for their profit. Because God, the God of heaven, he for our prophet now look at this i don't want to make you an example let me make myself an example let's say you feel this is the way i should go and you come to tell me that this is the way i should go but the way you do it has the tendency to make me angry it has the tendency to make me resistant and to make me say, okay, what's he going to do, mother, what he's done? Look at the pressure he's putting me under. And look at what he's doing. Okay, go ahead. I'm here. 
I want to punish me, punish me. You are not trying, you are not helping, but when you come and what you do and the way you do it, you have the purpose, you want to set me right without making me feel condemned, without making me feel that I've not done any good at all. It is that attitude that will make us partakers of his holiness. That's how God works and that's how God does things. So when you want to correct people, when you want to turn people to the right direction, do it with the intention that you will be effective. If you only make the man, you make the woman angry and you make him or her rebellious and resistant. If you make him defiant and say, okay, what you want to do, uh, do you, I've not uh, done anything wrong and you think this is the way you want to treat me, all right, I'm available. I'm here, go ahead. That method does not help. If you want to help people, be very thoughtful and see how you help them. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, follow peace with all men. Even the people you are trying to correct, follow peace with all men. Don't do it in such a way that if you want to fight, fight, but I will correct you. If you want to rebel, rebel, but I will correct you. That one does not bear any fruit in the kingdom of God. If you're going to correct people, you're going to restore people, you're going to relieve people. It says, follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I pray we will see the Lord. Amen. Let me hear your amen. amen. I will see the Lord. Very difficult for a preacher who is earnestly contending for the faith. Very difficult for him if he's not careful. To see the Lord. He comes. Every time he comes. It's like he's angry with us. Pastor, what have we done? You look angry. Every time he comes, he looks like you know he's frowning at us. I thought you came to help. If a doctor came to me and wanted to treat me and he's frowning and he's angry, I won't allow him to inject me with anything. He might forget himself and just inject you with the wrong thing. When you want to help people and when you want to restore people and when you want to be an agent of redemption to people. You follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We shall see the Lord. Look at number three here. Number three is believers only backbone for heaven. In Galatians chapter six, I'm reading from verse five. For every man shall bear his own burden. Every man will bear the consequence of his action on earth. When we get to those pearly gates and when we stand before his judgment throne and he looks at our lives and he evaluates our lives and he places everything on the scale of heaven. Everyone will stand by himself. Not two people standing on that scale. The Lord say, hold on, line up. You stand on the scale. If you are weak and found wanting, it's too late to make amends. But if you make all the amends here now, before we come to that judgment day, and you know, everything you do, you, you are always of the consciousness that everyone, every man, every woman shall bear his own body. That will be a wonderful thing. That's why it says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Romans chapter 14, reading from verse 12. So then, every one of us, apostle, prophet, Evangelist, pastor, teacher, minister, member, missionary, everyone. He says, so then, every one of us 
shall give account of himself to God. Everyone, everyone, everyone shall give account of himself unto God. I pray when that day comes and you appear before the God of heaven, you give an account that God will say, well done. Faithful servant, faithful son, faithful daughter, enter into the joy of the Lord forever and ever in Jesus' name. Point number three now. Point number three, positively reflecting the fullness of our learning from Christ. Positively reflecting the fullness of our learning from Christ. We've learned a lot all through this our Christian journey of Christ. We learned from him. He is our Savior. We learn from Him. He is our sanctifier. We learn from Him. It's the strength and the power of our lives. We learn from Him. He's the shepherd and the bishop of our soul. We've learned how to live, how to relate, how to walk, how to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. We've learned how to love the believers as Christ loved us. We've learned how to love our neighbor as ourselves. We've learned how to keep on moving on and endure until the end. Now, we want to positively reflect the fullness of everything we've learned from Christ. In Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. You are taught by the teacher of the word. And it says everything we have learned Let's practice that and let's see how to communicate everything we've learned by those who teach us good things. We're looking at three things here. Number one, it talks about the responsibility of teaching the word. If there are those who teach, there must be those who have the responsibility given by Christ that we should teach the word of God. The responsibility of teaching the word. Number two, is the response. The teacher has taught, and now you need to respond. The response to the teachers of the word. And then number three, our righteousness through the teaching of of the word. Let's come to number one is the responsibility of teaching the word. Matthew chapter 28, we're reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven. And in earth, verse 19, verse 19 says, go ye therefore. That's what therefore means because all power has been given unto him. And he's sending us, he's backing us up, he's supporting us, he's making that power to flow into our lives. It says, because all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto him, therefore go ye. And teach all nations. The responsibility now falls on you. Because you're saved. And because you are connected with him. It says, go. Teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things. Don't sift, don't choose, don't select, don't prefer. I prefer this 
faith, I prefer that. Healing, I prefer that. Deliverance, I prefer that. The supply of all my needs, I, so, I, I believe that, I accept that, everything. The Lord said, the responsibility we have in being teachers of the word, and we carry out that responsibility, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever, I have commanded you. Whatsoever I have commanded you. And then it says, and lo, as you're doing that, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And the believer shout, Amen. Amen. Look at number two here. Number two is the response to the teachers of the world. How do I respond? How do you respond when we have heard the word of God? It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. It says in First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading there from verse 10, ye are witnesses and God also. Ye are witnesses and God also. It, Paul the Apostle said, This is your response, Thessalonians. We come and we teach you, witness our lives. See whether what we're teaching matches with our action. Ye are witnesses. Don't just say, Yes, preacher, we're not allowed to see his life. Oh. You're allowed, you're witnesses. If he's teaching us to be loving, but he has hatred, be a witness. If he's teaching us that man and woman, husband and wife, should love each other, be a witness. Look at his family. If he's teaching us that it should be nice and gentle and humble and meek to everyone, watch. You have to watch. That's a response. If he's telling us to follow sound doctrine, every time, every way, watch him, watch him. Does he follow sound doctrine too? He are witnesses. Be a witness. Let the person who is teaching you understand that he is responsible to live by the word he's teaching us. But if you find that, you know, he's, he's a drinker, and if you find it's a smoker, if you find it's a, a licentious person, if you find it's not faithful to his wife, if you find it's not faithful in every area of life, be a witness. Yeah, witnesses and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves. Preachers also have behavior. And teachers have behavior. Pastors have behavior. Ministers have behavior. Behavior is not just for school children. Behavior is not just for those who are growing up. Everyone ought to have the behavior and the lifestyle of Christ. It says how unblameable we behave ourselves among you that believe. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, As she know how we exalted and comforted you and charged every one of you as a father, not as a slaveholder, as a father, not as a tyrant, as a father. The way we do the ministry and the way we interact with people and the way we do the teaching and the way we exemplify what we are passing across to the people as a father doth his children, not as a slave, Holder acts to the slaves, not as the tyrant acts to the terrified. 
were not to bring any terror to the people. Now, if in your leadership, leadership is not only of the preacher, the pastor, the minister, we have leadership there in that section, leadership there in that section, leadership there in that section, and you want to be successful. And in the beach, to be successful, it become like a terrifying tyrant. And everybody is afraid of you. And when the tyrant, the tiger comes, everybody runs into their holes. That's not leadership, my brother. That's not leadership, my sister. You know how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does to the children. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says that ye would walk worthy of God. That's your response. You've heard the word of God on meekness, on lowliness, on humility, on holiness, on gentleness among the people of God, on faithfulness, on integrity, anywhere you are. What's your response? That now you walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. And I pray the glory of the kingdom will reflect in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three, our righteousness through the teaching of the word. It's, it's the word that makes us righteous. It's not our brain. It's not our opinion. It's not our tradition. It's not what we had known in all those assemblies we've been before we got saved. What makes us righteous is what Christ has done and what Christ has accomplished and it comes fresh to our heart and we take that to the Lord and we say, Lord, Lord, help me to so live, help me to so behave that I will act out by grace, by grace, don't live out grace, by grace I'll act out everything you have deposited in my life. The Lord will help you. I said the Lord will help you. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that ye, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word will act like a cleansing agent in our lives. And it says, it will sanctify, it will cleanse by the washing of water, by the word. What's the goal? What's the purpose? What's the end result? What does he want to achieve in your life, in my life? Verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church. The Lord will make our church a glorious church. What's a glorious church? A glorious church is a church without backbiting, without criticism, without bad behavior, without worldliness, and without any of those things that looks that that trait is coming from Satan. Bury that one. Suspend that one. Throw that one away without anything coming from Satan through any member to the church. Our church will be glorious. It says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having sport or equal or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. When you are holy and I'm holy, when you don't have any blame, any blemish, and I don't have any blame, any blemish, when every one of us acts in the private, in the public, together, separated everywhere, we act and live in the holiness, in the character, in the worthiness of Christ, and he cleanses and purges us, and there's no hypocrisy, there's no hiding, there's no pretense, we're open and transparent, and we live the life that if Christ if Christ were to come today, if Christ were to come the next minute, exactly what I'm doing is what I'll keep on doing. That's a glorious church and the Lord will do it in your life. What are you there? 
I said, where are you there? The Lord perform it in your life in Jesus' name. Can he do it? I said, can he do it? He will do it. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we've heard your word. We're going to have the right response to your word. And the Lord will place, the Lord will wash, the Lord will sanctify, and the Lord will do everything he needs to do that he'll make you a spotless part of the glorious church. Let's pray. We have heard it again. 